right. Good. I just check the time. All right. So we're starting a little late, but thank you guys for bearing with me. It's been a long day. <laughs> been up since 4 a.m. I haven't had a meal yet, so um, I just came back. I'm, I'm not actually pumped, so. I just came back from an awesome conference with the Transformation Ministries Alliance, their inaugural conference. Uh, so it's a network of ministries and counselors and overcomers working together, uh, all sorts of people who have come out of LGBTQ uh, who have experienced the goodness of God in that area. So it was, it was great. It's a lot of my friends that I've known from other networks, other ministries, some friends that I just know from Facebook that I finally got to meet in person for a while. People I've interviewed on my YouTube channel, and like I get to see them in person finally. It was so it was really awesome. Um, I want to also pump some resources because we're not going to be able to go over everything tonight. I'm only going to do about a really truncated version of a larger uh, seminar I've done. Like this sexual identity crisis. I, I first did this in 2016. A friend of mine who's a pastor asked me to come to his church and do like an all day seminar. So it was like. The full version of this takes like four hours, so I'm just going to give you a very short version. Um, but please, consider me like your go-to guy. Um, but there's so many good resources, I just don't think the church is really aware of all that's out there. So, with TMA, the, the conference I just came from, with the different ministries that are represented there, with Restored Hope Network, uh, with so many others, uh, there's so much good stuff that I'm going to go over some things as well for how to sort through some of the different resources out there. So I'll pump a couple of books as well uh, as we go along or, or, or at the end. Um, because also if you do like a Google search, Christian responses to sexuality or gender, you're gonna get a variety of responses and, and results. So I'm gonna give you some tools for what to look for. All right, but first, this is kind of a no-brainer, but <laughs> we are in a crisis. This is the reality that we're in now. But I want us to kind of consider the word crisis for a moment. It actually means a turning point or a crossroad. And it can actually mean an opportunity. We look at crisis as always being a negative. But we actually don't grow without crises. I'm big on the developmental model and how, how we develop throughout the lifespan. And at each stage of development, you hit a certain crisis. And you need to face that crisis uh, in the right way so that you acquire a new strength, a new skill. And if you don't, then you're left with some sort of deficit. And you go to the next crisis with that deficit, and it hurts your ability to handle that crisis. So as a church and as a society, we're facing a crisis of sexual identity. And we have a great opportunity as a church because we know but the truth is, at least we should know. And so we, can, we have the opportunity to provide the answer that the world is desperate for. Um, how do we get in this crisis? Well, some crises are actually our own fault. Some are just a part of development, and some are our own fault. And so, yeah, like I said, some are part of normal growth, normal development, but I definitely believe part of this is twofold, in that the enemy is bring about this crisis because he knows how important our sexual identity is. Like I've talked about in, our, in my Sunday sermon about what God's vision for our sexuality is. It has great meaning. So the enemy hates that. He wants us to be blind to the meaning of our bodies so that we'll have to be blind to the meaning of the gospel. Um, but Part of it is also our own fault because the church has been negligent for years in teaching the truth about our sexuality, about gender, about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, about marriage. Uh, and so we're paying the consequences for that. So what are, what's at stake? There's several things that are at stake in this crisis. The authority of scripture is probably the top thing that's at stake. In the church, everything is being questioned about, did God really say, is this really the truth? Can we really know this? Uh, well, did the biblical authors really think that? Or, you know, uh, no, we, you'll hear things from these revisionist theologians 
He'll say, that, no, we have a high view of Scripture, but the biblical authors, they don't understand sexuality the way we do these days. As if God is ignorant. So he didn't know, oh, I know I should probably teach them something that they're going to need to know later. And he, he left out how to figure out LGBT stuff. No, it's all in there. There's no reason to think that Scripture doesn't provide everything we need to know about this in the most basic sense. So like I said as well, what's at stake is also the integrity of the gospel and the church because of the meaning of our bodies, the meaning of our sexuality. Also religious liberty. Big case right now, there's a landmark case going on in Malta. Who knows where Malta is? Over in the Mediterranean. It's in the Mediterranean. One of the earliest Christian nations. Think about it. Paul, on his way to Rome, shipwrecked in Malta and evangelized them for the gospel. So one of the earliest Christian nations. And a friend of mine, Matthew Greck, you know, it's funny how different countries have their own version of American shows. Or actually, it might have been a British show at first. So, X Factor Malta. All right, so there was X Factor, the singing competition in Malta. This is back in 2017, I think. Well, earlier, so he was going to be a performer. He's a Christian music artist, and he was a minister, and he's also an ex-gay. And he had lived a homosexual life, but he came to repentance, and he was auditioning for X Factor Malta. However, the time that he auditioned, Malta had passed a conversion therapy ban, meaning that you cannot preach that homosexuality is a sin and that you can change from it. And in the pre-audition interview, he shared about his testimony. And just the television station airing his testimony got the television station in hot water and almost got legal action against him. So that was several, a few years ago. They since bolstered their conversion therapy ban even more so that just uh, anything that seems to promote uh, the possibility of change would be considered conversion therapy. Just sharing your testimony is now conversion therapy. So he was interviewed on, on an online news station. So he was, it's, yeah, you have to go search for it. You have to look up the interview. It's not like it was broadcast on national TV there. It was an online interview. And they, he was sharing his testimony. And some activists heard it and called the police on him. So he is being tried. It's the first time, because there's several nations that are right now that have these conversion therapy bans. Canada, France, a uh, bunch of others. Uh, he's the first one who's actually being tried for it now. So a couple weeks ago was his, well, he had a hearing back in February, and then he had his second hearing a couple weeks ago, and now he's got another one coming up uh, sometime mid-July. Who knows how long this is going to take? Is he in jail? No, no, he's not in prison yet. But it could be, if he gets uh, set, uh, convicted, it'll be uh, five months in prison or, I think, what is it, 20,000 euros fine? Other countries have seen worse punishments. So, um, yeah. Does he live in Malta? Yeah. yeah. So, landmark case, what does, what does that mean? It means with. What's at stake is our ability to share your own testimony. If you come from an LGBT background, just you sharing how God has delivered you, saved you, even if it's just to the point of you repenting, that you could be punished for that. You could be persecuted for it. It limits our ability to share the goodness of what God has done in your life. Uh, it impacts people like me, the rights of counselors and clients. There's several, you know, like 20-something states and different cities and municipalities in the U.S. Starting in 2012 with California, they passed so-called conversion therapy bans. They used to call it SOCI, Sexual Orientation Change Efforts. But then they realized, well, we don't want to just ban therapy for sexual orientation. We want to ban therapy for gender identity. So let's just call it all conversion therapy. And they make a point in their bans that they make an exception 
for, well, it's not conversion therapy if you're doing uh, puberty blockers or mm. hormone replacement therapy to change your body to match your mentality of what your gender is. That's, if anything should be considered conversion therapy, it's that. But they make it, they put a clause in there, always make that very clear. That's not what we mean. We mean helping people align their thoughts with their actual body. That's conversion therapy. Does it make any sense to you? <laughs> so, so now they're all called conversion therapy bands. And most of them, they're all for children. There aren't any yet for adults. Uh, however, I'm, I hesitate to even say this because uh, I'm so public with what I do, but I know every time I, uh, I speak and I do a video, I am risking career suicide. Because uh, at the end of Governor Wolf's term, like right before he finished with his final term, he made an executive, executive order banning conversion therapy across the board. There's ways he worded it where it's like, well, only if you're using insurance. That's one of the reasons why I don't take insurance at my counseling practice. Uh, and also, they need an exception if you're using neutral approaches. Using what approaches? Neutral approaches. What does that mean? <laughs> I checked with my old lawyers, and they're like, uh, it's, a, it's a gray area. <laughs> Because I'm like, well, what I do is neutral. I don't impose anything on my clients. I don't preach at them. I don't tell them what they should think. They come to me with their own goals, and we don't even address sexuality in as direct a manner as they. The, the world has this very skewed idea about what goes on in the counseling office. It's it's insane. But I'll get into that more today. So yeah, it's impacting the rest of clients to get the therapy and the counseling that they really need to get the help that they want. Their own goals. Uh, most of the church sat on their hands when these bands started coming out because they just affected licensed counselors. And most of the church were like, well, they wanted to distance themselves. They, they basically treat us like pariahs. And so you heard a lot of people like Al Mohler say, well, we, we don't do reparative therapy. We just do biblical counseling. It's like, don't you realize they're going to come after you next? And they are. Because now in Canada, they passed Bill C-4 last year, or the year before where it doesn't matter if you're a licensed counselor, it's anyone. Victoria, Australia, if you just pray for someone struggling with their sexuality or gender identity, that's considered conversion therapy and it's punishable. It's a criminal offense. So it was just a matter of time. There, there's always our goal to go after pastors as well, not just licensed therapists. So it affects the right of every citizen. And above all, like, like we're getting to here, our souls are at stake. People are being trapped in a confusion, in sin, and being told there's no way out. You're not allowed out. You can look at these conversion therapy bands, it's really must stay gay bills. So people are actually struggling with this issue. I always try to put this out. This is not just a culture war issue. It's not just, oh, we need to stop this LGBT agenda, as much as I agree with that. But there are real life people in the crosshairs who are struggling. to match a new ideology. It's a revolution. So if you've ever read 1984, they call it new speak. Every word has a new meaning. You can't say things plainly. You can't even say that a man is a man. What's a man? What's a woman? It's a whole new language. So, but we as believers, we stand on the word. A word that does not change. Right. That is not influenced by the culture that may change and is like, Shifting winds and sands and waters. No, we, we're firmly planted on the word. And when I say the word, I always mean three things. Not every Christian tends to mean it this way, but I, this is what I always mean when I talk about the word. First is the logos. That's the, the reason by which the whole world operates. God created us with intentionality. And there's a design to which God created us. That's the, the logos reason of God in creation. So basically it means, that means that general revelation is possible. We can look at creation and 
see the truth that God wanted to reveal just by the way he created us. Like, it's not just Christians who know this stuff. Because throughout generations, people knew the basic of basics of what it means to be a male and female, how we're supposed to function sexually, for the most part. As it says in Romans, that we can know from creation the truth. You have to actively suppress it, your knowledge of truth. So the logos, that's a, the way by which God created everything. It's a reason, it's a logic to it. And we also need the word of God, scripture. But also the word, the logos, made flesh, Jesus Christ. So when I talk about the word, I mean those three things. God, his general revelation, but also his special revelation. And there's two versions of God's special revelation. The Bible, the inspired words of God, spoken through different authors. But the final revelation of God is Jesus himself, who came in a body to restore our bodies to their original goodness and truth and beauty. So, we have to combat certain myths. I my Bible. How did I forget my Bible? Anyway, 2 Timothy 4, 2 to 4. This is a passage I always read when I go over this. I know we went over this in our uh, evangelism class. So let me just pull that up real quick. I used to do a presentation at a youth conference. We used to take our youth group to called Myths About Homosexuality. And we'll start with this passage. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Mm -hmm. And that time is now. We are in a crisis because the church has failed in this regard. When I was growing up, I didn't hear people talk about sexuality. It was just assumed everyone was on the same page. And unfortunately, the reality is we just took a cue from the world. Because in the early years of growing up, the world was actually very hostile to homosexuality. And so the attitude you might have heard in the church was just hostility or making fun of it. And so we err when we get our cues from the world. Oh, yeah, 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 let's make fun of it. Instead of, there's brokenness here we should be sensitive to and have a heart to redeem. Now, as the world is all pro-gay, you have churches who now are like, well, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what to say about it. So they're either silent or they're now affirming. This is what happens when you're not firmly rooted in the truth and you just keep speaking the truth no matter what direction the culture goes. Because you never know, the culture may end up coming back toward us, but if you're busy chasing the trends, you're going to miss it. But yes, right now, people are not tolerating sound doctrine. But guess what? I'm not worried about what people will not tolerate, so I just speak the truth. And I trust God with the consequences. Mm -hmm. Because they're going to get their experts uh, tell them what they want to hear. They don't want to listen to truth right now. But we keep speaking it, and those who have an ear to hear will hear. So we have to have a biblical worldview. I also call it like an integrated worldview. I've talked about this in a couple of other past sermons, so I'm going to go over this part briefly. These are some essentials we should all know. God is the creator of all reality. <coughs> all right? And he created purposely. He didn't create anything by accident. And he created purposefully. So everything he created has a purpose. He has a design for all that he created. And his design, his destiny for whatever he created is what determines morality. If something falls short of his design and, and purpose, it is disordered. That's why I don't make a huge distinction between disorders and sin. Because they both are ultimately missing the mark of God's design and destiny. And the physical, what God's purpose that he created the physical world for is to reveal the truth, to reveal spiritual realities. That's why the physical world in your body has inherent meaning. So what's the purpose, what are the purposes of sex? Well, obviously, it's procreation. All creature, creatures that are sexual, the reason they're sexual is that's the, the means by which they procreate. 
humans is more than that. We're not just animals. For us, sex is also the consummation of the marital vows. And it's supposed to be loving. It's, supposed to be, it's doing good unto the other. It's not just using the other. But God also made it pleasurable. But the pleasure is a consequence of the others, of that consummation, of the love. God, God's smart, though. He's like, well, I want to give people an incentive to want to unite with each other. So let's make this deed pleasurable. The problem is, in our sexual revolution world, we've, we've taken the inherent meaning out of sex. So now, well, what, makes, what, what gives sex its meaning and what's its purpose? Well, the pleasure. However much, whatever gives you pleasure, then there's a meaning, there's a purpose of it. But like we've talk, talked about as, as well, sex is designed by God to give us a glimpse of what's to come. And so that's God's ultimate destiny for us, to be the bride of Christ. So uh, I'm going to skip the YouTube videos that I've shown before in other presentations, but we've thought over this in my last sermon. Our bodies reveal the very logic of God. And this is true of just in Jesus himself coming in the flesh. Jesus came in a body to reveal the Father. God is spirit. How can we know it? Because Jesus came. That's the, that's the, the meaning of the incarnation. He came to reveal the invisible. And our sexual desire that God put within us, that urge to merge, God gave in the pleasures that come from sexual activity, they're meant to be just tastes of the ultimate ecstasy that we will experience in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, yes, you can have sex in this life, and you can even have a great sex with your wife, but ultimately that won't satisfy you. Because it's, it's only meant to be a taste. Like Jesus said to the woman at the well, you'll drink some of the water, but you'll be thirsty again. But I offer you water that you, once you drink it, you'll never thirst again. So we're in the, the here but not yet of that reality. We get glimpses of it, we get tastes of it when we have an amazing worship service, when you're in creation, you're in nature, and you get a glimpse of the awe of God, when you are having an amazing time with your spouse, when you're with your children, you're just having a great time with them, you get glimpses of the goodness of God, but we get to experience it fully. Now we see as in a mirror darkly, but then we'll see face to face. So only He can satisfy our longings. So, biblical and integrated sexuality is the male and female are just, they're irremovable aspects of being made in the image of God. And it reveals something about God, that God is an eternal communion of life-giving love. And our bodies in the sexual difference reflect that unity and diversity. And they point to that greater future of destiny for us. So we've talked about that before. And so our sexual morality is based on that symbolism. It's meant to preserve that symbolism. So normality, what is actually normal, is not so much about what is common or what just happens to take place, but normality should be determined by what is according to design. So normality is that which functions according to its design. For you to not sexually function according to the way God designed us to sexually function would be abnormal. So, I'm making a clear case here for why it was wrong for them to have taken homosexuality out of the DSM in 1973. The reason they did that is because of activism, and because ultimately the philosophy of the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, became more and more postmodern. And just, well, we'll just go based off uh, if there's other issues with it. You know, this, they lost grasp with a, an, understand, an objective understanding of reality. That there's a way that humans are meant to function. So it's whatever the consensus is. But we have a, a call for normative sexuality. And just the very word normative, that's a huge trigger word these days. All right, everything right now is about deconstructing norms. That's the mission of the deconstructionists, the social justice ideologues, the woke uh, movement. They hate the idea of there being norms. That's Marxism, basically, is to overthrow everything. 
Uh, and so you have a new status quo eventually. It's a revolution. We're tearing it down. Yes. Just like in the it's, military. In the military, everybody comes together, but then everything what you learn, they tear it all down so you can yep. come together. Yeah, so for those who can't hear it, this is exactly what they do in the military. When you go to boot camp, they take your individuality and they break you so that you have no individuality anymore. You just become an army of one. You're, you're one of the drones in the Middle East. Uh, so you can be reshaped to whatever the mentality is of that system. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're seeing now. That's why it's in your schools. People all want to know, why are they teaching this in the schools? Because once gay marriage passed, then why, why are we making a distinction between gay marriage and uh, male-female marriage? It's all the same now. In fact, you shouldn't even call it gay marriage. It should just be called marriage. They want to totally break down any dissent so there's only one new mentality. So I called it when this first happened, like, well, guess what? Now you're going to see gay representation in all your commercials. It doesn't even matter if it's sexual in nature. It's just going to be something you're going to see it everywhere. It was always part of the agenda. I can go into this more in depth, but I don't have time. So normative sexuality, the idea I'm using, even using the word normative means that our sexuality actually has a standard, a purpose. People hate that. Normative, normative sexuality means that men and women, in a free, full, and faithful, one flesh union that is open to life. That's the, the way God meant for our sexuality to be expressed. So that means he also ordained a process for us to reach that norm. It doesn't just happen. This sometimes brings a little bit of relief to guys I'm working with, with same-sex attraction. Uh, when I explain that actually heterosexuality, or the opposite sex attractions, is an achievement. It doesn't just happen, there's actually prerequisites for people to get to that place where they have attractions to the opposite sex. We just assume it. Oh, well, it's just natural. Well, that's because the world is duped into thinking there's different categories of people. Straight people and gay people. And straight people develop attractions to the opposite sex. Gay people are always going to be attracted to the same sex. Because that's just the way they are designed. That's just the way they are. But we're all... There is, there is no gay straight. Those are all social constructs. There's only two sexual identities. And it's right there in Scripture. Male and female. And that's revealed to us by the design of the body. Well, that just tells us if you're male or female. That just reveals what gender you are. No, that also reveals what sexual orientation you have. Because if you look at the body, the male body and the sexual difference in the genitalia makes no sense by itself. So the body itself also reveals the way we're supposed to be oriented for union. It should be obvious to us, but because of all the propaganda, we don't realize it. But to develop the attractions, there needs to be certain things in place. So there's a normative process by which God had developed or ordained for that to happen. So some of those things for that normative process is, are, are natural and some must be nurtured. The problem is all of those aspects have been affected by the fall. Now, a good society promotes, and also a good church, of course, promotes and protects these norms and the development of these norms. We don't live in a good society. We don't even live in a society that is uh, positively impacted by the church. The church has no, no influence on the society anymore. The, the society influences the church. But there was a time that we took for granted that most of our American culture was pretty much a Christianized culture. There were a lot of cultural Christians, and that's why we failed to teach this stuff, because we just assumed it's the way it would always be, until the 60s and the sexual revolution came around. Now, what leads to having sexual attractions, just in general? The idea of attraction means that you recognize the other as a good. That's just basically what it means to be attracted to someone. Now, the doesn't necessarily mean sexual attraction. I could be uh, 
like Jane, I can be attracted to you in that I think you're pretty cool, and I love having a good conversation with you. So if I were to like in a group, I'm like, there's Jane, let me go talk to Jane. That's a same-sex attraction, but it's not a sexual same-sex attraction. It's not eroticized. That's just, that's the type of attraction that leads us to want to develop a connection with people. What leads to sexual attraction is seeing the sexual difference of the other, or the sexual aspects or attributes of the other as a good for you. Okay? And what that then does is it provides a direction for your sexual urges. Like we all, you know, once puberty comes, you have sexual urges. Some people have them earlier than official puberty, probably because they've been uh, sexualized prematurely. But it's a general urge. I mean, we go through waves sometimes, of horniness or whatever, but we have the sexual urges, but it's kind of uh, needs a direction. So then we find someone that attracts us, and there, oh, now I got a direction for my sexual urge. <laughs> Beautiful wife. <laughs> okay. Now, normative attraction, the way God designed our attractions to work, it starts with being at a place where you are secure in your sexuality, or at least secure enough. I work with a lot of guys with no same-sex attraction. They, they have opposite-sex attractions, but they're not fully secure in their sexuality, not fully secure in their masculinity. Okay, so... You don't have to be perfect to be good enough to get to that place where, okay, I'm good enough as a male that I uh, see that I have something to offer. But you need to be secure enough in your gendered body. It's an embodied experience. And you must see yourself as a good gift. That you, once you know that I'm secure in my masculinity, well, once you know what that really means, it means I have something to offer a woman. Myself, a whole gift of self. I desire to give of myself. So we also see how even in heterosexual relationships, it could be pretty abnormal and, and kind of uh, objectifying when you're not looking to actually give of yourself, but rather to take and to use and manipulate in order to build up yourself. No, it, you must first have that security in who you are so that you know that you're good and you have something good to offer to someone else. But then you must also see the other sex as a good. And then identify a particular person of the opposite sex that is a good for you. So that you can make the new one flesh union and you develop that together. That's the way God designed our attractions to work. So just think about that, you can think of, gosh, even us straight people, you know, or heterosexual, we have all sorts of disordered attractions. You know, I work with guys who are like, I'm like, dude, you are attracted to the wrong type of girls. Like, you keep going after these girls who just manipulate you and use you. And there's reasons for that. There's vulnerabilities, there's insecurities you got that we gotta work through, all right? When I'm working with someone, same sex attraction, it's the same deal, but it's at a deeper level. It goes back earlier in life. <coughs> Identity. It's one of those uh, words that fudge. It's a word I actually don't like using that much because the world tells you that your identity is your, your thoughts, is your self-concept. And uh, even a lot of conservatives, they just go along with that. Yeah, there's sex and then there's gender identity. And gender identity is how you view yourself. And I, the best thing you can probably do is throw that out. That is the terrible way to view identity. Your identity is not how you view yourself. And identity is reality. This is a book. How? How is this a book? Because we know the basic definition of what a book is. It fits the definition of a book. It doesn't need to think it's a book. I don't need to think it's a book. It is a book. I am a man. I don't need to feel like a man. I don't need to have the thoughts that make me think I'm a man. I am a man. That's just simple reality. Your body reveals your identity. There's objective criteria. This is what we used to call uh, the essentialist view, that there are essential traits you must have in order to have a certain identity. If you've seen Matt Walsh's documentary, there's a moment where he's talking to a gender theorist, and he's trying to get him to answer, well, what is woman? And he's like, well, he's, he's wiggling around it, he can't answer the question. Because ultimately, he's coming from a social constructionist view, where identity is totally subjective to the person. It's whatever you think it is. 
There's no essential traits that you must have in order to have that identity. And that's completely false. We must reject that outright as Christians. Look at the root words, look at the etymology of identity. It comes from the Latin identitas. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. But the root word for that is item, which means the same. The idea is that to have a certain identity, you must have the same essential traits as those in that group. There are essential traits that I need in order to be a male. And it's not how athletic I am, it's not how tall I am, it's do I have the male reproductive system. Simple as that. Biblically, identity is always something that's determined by your heritage, by how you're born, or is bestowed upon you by an authority figure. Like God may give a new identity to say, Jacob, you're now Israel. But it's never something you create for yourself. This idea that you can choose your own identity is a new and novel concept. So scriptural sexual identity, which is why this went over, is male female. Simple as that. In the beginning, God made them male and female. There's your sexual identities. And it's not just because the Bible says it, it's because nature shows it. It's just, it's the two of them are in concert together. Scripture, the general revelation, and special revelation work together right there. If you look at the root meaning to the word gender, gen is to produce. And genus, we get to, from that same root word, we get all the words like generate. Generation, generosity, uh, uh, genre. So it's about kind and type, but it's about reproducing of your own kind. So gender, I have to say, is synonymous with sex. Technically, if you go back in the past, it was just a literary term for, at least in English, we primarily use this as a literary term, because you have, most languages, aside from English, are gendered languages, yeah masculine and feminine words. Uh, we don't tend to do that, but in the 50s, I think it was uh, John Money, he wanted to make a distinction between sex and gender. Now, John Money was the first one at Johns Hopkins University to start experiment, experimenting on kids with um, gender reassignment surgeries or sex change surgeries. So he had to justify it somehow. So he said, well, there's sex, which is biological, but gender is something different. Gender is just the way you view yourself and how society treats you based on the stereotypes of what a male is and what a female is. So he wanted to use a word to make a distinction between sex and gender. Uh, so he took the gender to do that. But I would say if we ever use the word gender at all, it should just simply be synonymous with sex. It's the simplest and it makes the most sense. Um, so how do we determine gender? Well, same root word. If you understand it properly, gender means the manner by which one generates. And that's determined by your genitals. The male is the one that gives the seed to inseminate life. The female is the one that opens to receive that seed, to conceive new life, and to bear it. Now we do have some gender-based traits or gender-based stereotypes. And a lot of times people just use uh, gender as a shorthand for those things. I don't like doing that because then it gets people more confused. So they say, well, gender means being masculine. And what's masculine about? Well, masculinity is about whatever is uh, culturally stereotypical for men. Like being athletic, liking rough and tumble play, um, being tough and uh, being stoic, not very emotional, that's gender. And being female means uh, liking pink and liking listening to pop music and uh, liking flowers and frilly things. That's the female gender. And when we make that synonymous with sex itself, those, those gender-based stereotypes, that gets people, especially kids, really confused. Because what you're doing now in school is if you get someone who is what we used to call gender non-conforming, or you can also just say gender atypical, that their presentation, the things that they're interested in, the, the activities they do, the, the style that they have, just is not typical of the rest of their gender. 
We then say, well, that must mean you're actually the opposite sex. And these kids were so impressionable. Just, well, I guess that makes sense because I'm having a hard time feeling with the other girls. Um, because I'm not into all the things they do and I don't know how to connect with them and I seem to like all the things that boys like. Well, we used to call that a tomboy and everyone understood that she was still a girl and she was going to develop into a regular girl eventually. She just liked hanging out with boys and doing fun stuff outdoors like boys do. But now, no, because you're into stereotypical things that boys are into, that makes you a boy. So, we get ourselves in a lot of trouble when we take this idea of gender and we broaden it to more than just the reality of your body. So God has a design for us to get us to his norms. All right. First is your body has to actually provide the necessary sex characteristics and they emerge at the appropriate stages. Then, at birth, and actually before birth, the baby is bonding with mom. So during pregnancy, the baby is bonding, but definitely afterwards, uh, it's like God's not an idiot. <laughs> he made it so. Um, one of our neurotransmitters, one of our hormones that we emit is oxytocin, where uh, when you're bond, like when you're nursing and having sex, there's two main ways. Uh, you release this chemical, moms do, and, and it helps you bond with your baby. And in sex, it helps you bond with a partner. We're not meant, like everyone says, no, monogamy isn't natural. That's, that's actually not true. God gave us things in our bodies that actually bind us together. So don't buy what the world says. It says that monogamy is not natural to us. So attachment is important. That gives us your basic sense of identity, the basic sense of being a person. And also a sense that I'm good, I'm of value. What moms provide, a nurturing, well-attuned mom, is they provide a sense of value for just being, just existing. I often joke around that uh, moms could love a serial killer. <laughs> like this. They, a well-tuned mom just makes her kid feel like, I don't, I can always go to mom. She will always be there for me. But also gives you a first sense that other people can be trusted. Others can be good. What dad provides is separation and individuation. And that comes at particular stages. Boys need that to start happening earlier than girls. So for boys, from age three to five, they need to start the process of disidentifying with mom, at least enough, and bonding with dad so that they realize, oh, I'm a boy, because around age three, or actually around two, kids start becoming curious about gender. They can tell there's a difference between men and women. And they need to know which one are they. And so they need a male role model that helps them see, you're actually gonna grow up into me, into someone like me and becomes a model for them. And for that to happen, the, the father or the father figure needs to be what we call salient. He needs to be one that the child wants to emulate. And for boys, the salient father is, has to be perceived, at least, by the child as strong, capable, powerful, and benevolent. He's good nature, he's good hearted, fun as well. Some of my clients, they struggle because their dad never did fun stuff with them. He was good nature, he provided for them, and he was strong, but he didn't play games, he didn't wrestle with them, he didn't know how to joke around with them. So that was one thing that uh, contributed for them in some ways. And so the same sex family members must all be like that. The dad becomes gateway into the world of men. So if you have brothers for the boy, and uh, same sex peers, more, this is a continuing process of identifying more and more. Because we have a basic need, all of us, for same sex attachment affection, acceptance, approval, affiliation. And if those aren't met, then we crave them to a strong degree. And then the members of your family and your community who are the opposite sex, they become, they represent the goodness of the opposite sex, the gender difference. And so when you have a good bond with even people of the opposite sex, then that gives you a model for, oh, I want to bond with them later. 
But you have to go through that stage of first identifying through those sex. Also, it's important, or necessary, for your parents to model healthy pairing and mutuality, that they have a good relationship. That you see that it's actually a good thing for man and woman to be together. I want that one day. And uh, so, by, by your toddler years, by, you need to have that basic sense of your gender identity. Um, what that does is, as you continue in that gender identity security, then by puberty, you get a rush of sex hormones, so now you're interested in the sex that you are not. You know, you're so like, secure in your masculinity, and then you're, uh, you're one of the boys, you're one of the guys. So when puberty comes, you're like, uh, I got what I need from you dudes. I want to bond with her, okay? I want to know what it's like to be with someone else, <laughs> someone different. There's a mystique. You know, we call it the uh, exotic becomes erotic. And it's important that throughout the earlier stages, as a boy is growing up, and girls as well, that their gender-based traits, to some degree, um, we don't want to just reinforce stereotypes, uh, but that they are, they acquire the basic things that they need in order to successfully associate with their own sex. All right. So, unfortunately, cultural stereotypes do matter to an extent. Uh, it just sometimes matters what culture you're in. You know, for example, growing up, one church I went to, they worshipped God and football. <laughs> and if you didn't, if you weren't into football, you didn't fit in as a guy. And I didn't give a crap about sports. So. But fortunately, there are other ways I can bond, and I was confident in my masculinity enough in other ways. But we had such narrow-minded ideas of what it means to be masculine. Like a lot of the guys I work with, they hate men's retreats. Because all they hear about when they, it's a men's retreat is, oh, guns and like uh, sports and monster trucks and that's manly stuff. And they're like, that's not what I'm into. We have such a narrow-minded view of what it means to be masculine. Like, there's other versions of masculinity that should be affirmed as well. Like, there's other archetypes in there. We, we just affirm the warrior archetype, but there's also the, the philosopher, the guys who like to study and think deep things. That needs to be affirmed. Uh, the artist, poet. You know, I'm an artist. Uh, I'm glad that my dad was an artist as well. My dad's a macho guy, but he also is artistic and very creative. He, we made banners for our old church, and my dad loved being creative. So it was never, I didn't get the message that being into arts is girly or not masculine, but a lot of guys do, and it's not affirmed. So, and then girls as well, they have their stereotypes that are just very rigid. Uh, they, they're getting more encouragement to be more like guys in stereotypical ways, so that's ultimately why I think you see a little more bisexuality among girls than you do guys, because there's a little more freedom with what they can explore and identify with. It's a root issue. It's also very important that the child is protected throughout all these developmental stages, protected from premature sexualization. That's okay. Yeah, that they're not molested. They don't have uh, some sort of sexual encounter early in life. They're not exposed to pornography. It's essential. Mm -hmm. To have their innocence protected. So, when puberty comes, then, if you've gone through those stages and you're protected from those things, that you have the, the natural desires that emerge for the opposite sex, you've achieved that opposite sex attraction. Now, the next stage is the ability, the competence, really, to relate to the opposite sex in a healthy way, proper way. Um, and that can be difficult for some guys. So, some guys that I work with have woundings from the opposite sex, a lot of rejection there. Gone over this before, so out of the norms is where we get our morality. Um, I'm going to try to blaze through because I want to leave time for questions. Um, let me see here. We can get into all the different arguments about sexual morality and about whether or not homosexuality and transgenderism is wrong. Um, I'm going to kind of move past that for a bit, and I want to point out something that's really important to understand. There are now, at this point, there's, I would say, five. There's 
four major views in the church. I, I add a fifth one as well when I talk about this more. Uh, several years ago, I was at a conference, Restored Hope Network, in 2018, and one of the speakers showed this chart. And this was really helpful for me because it was just after we had a meeting with uh, the planning committee of a youth conference we used to go to all the time. The one where I used to do this workshop on myths about homosexuality. Well, sadly, that youth conference shifted in their position over the years. So that when I wanted to do a workshop on gender in 2018, they told me, ah, Andrew, things have changed. <laughs> we now have a lot of gay-affirming churches coming to our youth conference, and we don't want to offend them. Before they invited me to speak up about homosexuality, back in 2010, 11, and 12. Now they didn't want to hear it. So I go to this conference and present this chart that you can see that there's now different views within the church. I know you can't really see that, so I'm going to move to the next slide here. I, a friend of mine, uh, Linda Seiler, she's a former, uh, she used to have uh, gender dysphoria, and she's been radically changed, and former lesbian. Uh, so she kind of took that model, and she expanded it, added a fifth one, which I'm surprised we didn't think of, but that's the condemnation stream. So she calls them streams instead of columns, because some people flow between the streams. So most of us are probably familiar with the condemnation stream, the attitude that God hates gays and they're all going to hell. And in fact, we should bring back criminalization of homosexuality and actually they should deserve the death penalty. Like, there actually are some very fringe pastors who preach this. Most of us think about the Westboro Baptists. Now, this was not in the original chart because I think most of us Christians we're like, oh, psh, we just outright reject that mentality. But sadly, that's what the world thinks of when they think of Christians. That that's what we think. But they're such a fringe, but we have to account for them. But then you have the affirmation stream. It's also called Side A, Gay Christianity. And this is basically that there's nothing wrong. It's not a sin at all. God approves of homosexuality. And they even claim to have a high view of scripture. Just try to say that the scriptures that we call the clobber passages that condemn homosexuality, that we're, we're misunderstanding those. That they're actually very culturally based or they're just about certain pagan practices or just about exploitive sex and uh, about pederasty and, and uh, molestation, not about two loving, committed, monogamous people of the same sex. Well, so they, that's the they, affirmation stream. And they've also removed sin. The yes. term sin. Yeah, you tend to see that as well. But they, yeah, I'm going to try to give you guys a brief version here. But yes, you can get into a nuance more because actually there's two versions of the affirmation stream. The one is that old version that I was talking about. It's like, well, it is sinful if it's not monogamous, if it's promiscuous. But now you've got queer theory infiltrating the church. And if you look up YouTube, Brandon Robertson is this queer pastor who he'll advocate for using pornography, he'll advocate for polyamory. There's no limits. The more and more this queer theory is, because the queer theory is all about deconstructing norms. So eventually, it's going to overtake the rest of the affirmation stream and it's going to keep creeping into the church more and more. So you can't say anything of the sin. So then we got this accommodation stream, which is called Side B Gay Christianity. And what they say is that, well, no, people are just, they're just gay or trans. You know, they just are LGBTQ or they'll say they're SSA, um, but they'll use SSA not to refer to their experience or something that they have, but rather something that they are. What's SSA? Same-sex attraction. Sorry, short term, shorthand for something I use all the time. Same-sex attraction, usually referring to same-sex sexual attraction. And so they would basically agree with all the same terminology that the world uses, but they just say, but we still agree with the Bible that only, marriage is only meant to be between a man and a woman. Okay? So they, they only condone sex between a husband and a wife. But they'll just say, you are gay, though. You just are. So what, the, what does that leave for pastoral care? Well, it means you just have to be celibate for life by default, because that's just what you are. But you're going to be lonely, so what then? Oh, well, then you can enter into a spiritual friendship, which is you and your friend, who may also have same-sex attraction, you enter into a committed covenantal relationship. You just can't have sex together. It's basically a sexless marriage. 
So you'll see people like Wesley Hill, who's a big promoter that he wrote a book, uh, Spiritual Friendship. It's basically emotional enmeshment and codependency. And you read the stories of the people, and they're all torn up when like the friend goes and gets married. And they're like, well, what are you gonna do with me now? Like they just they don't grow. They're stuck in arrested development. Or if you do into a into a real marriage with some of the opposite sex, they call it a mixed orientation marriage. How would you like that? If I had a little bit of same sex attraction, but I'm working through it, but I, I marry my wife, but I tell her, well, I'm gay still. We're in a mixed orientation marriage. Or a Jackie Hill Perry, she's real famous, she's pretty well known, especially among evangelicals. She says she's functionally heterosexual. She's been in this stream as well. So it really offers no hope for anyone. It leaves them stuck where they're at. The next stream is what I call the mortification stream. Some people call it side Y. And so they reject the side B arguments that you can still identify as gay just add a label of gay Christian. They say, no, the same-sex attraction behaviors and the identity as well, they are sin and the results of the sin nature. So we must kill it. You have to kill a sinful nature and renounce any LGBTQ identity. Their main thing is repentance. They're, they just promote repentance. It's, that's your goal. That's, they, some of them may believe change is possible, but it comes through constantly repenting of the sin repenting of the attractions that they come up. I would normally consider them my allies, but a lot of people in that stream are very critical and harsh toward people like myself. Like one of the big names in this stream is Christopher Yuan. He's a big name in the evangelical world. He's a professor at Moody Bible College. And so he talks, when he talks about say, the work I do, he says, oh, it's all Freud, it's not biblical. It's all Freud. And it's just a way to uh, kind of disparage any sort of counseling that can help people actually experience change because they come from a super biblical worldview that only special revelation matters. Things for, that you can learn from uh, general revelation is not valid to them. So, and he's like, if a biblical worldview says that it's just sin, and what, we, what is the solution to sin? Repentance. We already know the answer to sin is repentance. That, to me, I would say, that is a very necessary first step. But it's not enough a lot of times. So those in my ministry field, we, are under, we would call ourselves the transformation stream. Some people call us side X. We like to also call ourselves the rebuild column. And that's where we say that, yes, the sin nature is the main culprit. But it's not like you just play a sin lottery and that's how you get your signature sin. There are root wounds <laughs> and deficits that make you vulnerable to particular temptations. And God wants to do more than just give you the grace necessary for forgiveness. And not just the grace to uh, endure temptation, but he wants to also develop your, your freedom. He, he also gives you grace to heal or, and keep growing. So we are very much in agreement with mortification stream. We'd rather be allies with them, and we're working on that. One of the, one of the people who used me in that mortification stream, who was very critical of us as well, another big name is Rosario Butterfield. She would condemn us a lot. But last year she came to our conference, at the Restore Hope Network conference, and she repented. She actually, one of the things that helped her repent is my friend, Darren, he's, uh, I'm part of another organization called Voice of the Voiceless. We advocate for ex-LGBT voices. And um, she heard him do a speaking engagement where he, he said how he was hurt by her condemnation of those of us in the street. And she, she was convicted. So she's now being apologetic about how she, she just, basically she condemned us because she bought into all the propaganda against our ministry. All the propaganda says, well, we're conversion therapists and we just try to promote some sort of cure that's not possible. And it's harmful and it's, gives people false hope, and we're basically, they claim that we're like prosperity gospel preachers, saying once you're saved, you'll be totally radically changed from gay to straight. We don't, we don't teach that. But we do teach progressive sanctification, progressive healing. We do say you should seek growing and uh, magnanimity, magnanimity, meaning keep going for the big things that God has for you. Don't just settle for, all right, thank you, Lord, for forgiving me. Keep growing. 
So God wants to bring full restoration. It might not be fully realized as life, but you don't know to what extent you can experience healing and growth. He wants to bring a reintegration, bring the parts of the self together through repentance, but also through emotional and relational healing. That God does himself in some powerful ways. I've worked with clients where it's like, I'm glad I have God as like the supreme counselor because he does stuff in between my sessions that I can't do. He does stuff in the sessions too in powerful ways. But I work with guys and like, we'll work on memories that's at the root of some things and that brings them healing. But then in the in between sessions, God like ministers to them in some powerful way. He shows up in some way. It's like, yeah, God, keep bringing it. So I want you guys to be aware there are certain uh, voices in the church today. You need to be aware of them because uh, some of them are going to attack the work we do. And some of them will, might offer uh, at least correction to the side B, but they, they are not equipped to help people go further than repentance. And a lot of people from that mortification stream are pretty much just people who have their own testimony, but they're not really involved in ministry to help people beyond themselves. So they just nor they normalize their own testimony. Um, whereas I really care more about the voices of those who are actually helping people on a regular basis. And so they have to actually have good answers for when you hit snags in, in the healing process. And you work with enough people, you know that there's variations of the issues. All right, I'm, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of this stuff so we have time for Q&A. I just want to leave with a couple things here. What should our overall response be? Love, truth, and hope. All right? Uh, the side B gay Christians like to say that we're offering love. The church for too long has been condemning, so we're offering love to them by saying, you can be gay, just don't act on it. It's an easy, slippery slope into the affirmation street. But love is more than just being kind and gentle to people. Love is also providing the help they need to, to get healing and integration. And there's ways to approach them in love. We also have to bring truth. We have to bring truth. We cannot be... I'm at the point where I just speak plainly about this stuff. For a while, I, I, I was advised by people in my ministry field, no, we have to police the way we speak. You know, don't use the term gay lifestyle anymore. That it's offensive to them. So now they say gay life. Like, what's the difference? <laughs> you, know? you can't say gay lifestyle, you can, but you say gay life. When I was in the gay life. Versus in the gay lifestyle or a gay lifestyle. I'm like, ah, you know what? I'm done with the self censoring. I'm just going to speak plainly about it. <laughs> you know? it's just, we just need plain truth. People need clarity. You know? So, um, one of the people in that side B gay Christian movement, he's not a side B gay Christian himself, but one of the biggest voices, like your research stuff, uh, like a biblical approach to these issues, you'll probably come across the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender by Preston Sprinkle. He's hugely popular in the evangelical world now. He's one of the big names in the Revoice conference. Who's heard of Revoice? Wow, okay. So, <laughs> at least one of us. So, Revoice, they did their first conference in 2018. And it was uh, a conference to promote the flourishing of LGBTQ Christians. All side B gay Christians. And uh, so Preston Sprinkle, he has this whole curriculum that he gives to churches to how to address LGBTQ, especially for children. And if you miss like one part of one of his sermons that it says that homosexuality is still sin, you'll think it's pro-gay. You'll walk away thinking, like, uh, I, was, I was watching an interview with Christopher Yulon, Beckett Cook, and he was sharing that a lot of these churches that started using the curriculum, they, halfway through, they stopped using it because they're like, oh my gosh, um, our kids are getting more confused by this. There's this, in the efforts to be kind and loving, people over nuance things. So that there's no more clarity, they muddy the waters. So people aren't getting truth. But the problem is if you just give truth, you just preach the truth that homosexuality is a sin, it just brings discouragement to people. So we need both love and truth, but if you just say, well, God loves you and it's a sin, but if you're not offering hope, it really leaves people in despair as well.
So that's why I do what I do, because I don't want to just leave people floundering. I want to offer them hope. And that's why this weekend, this conference I was at, just so encouraging. Uh, back in 2018, California tried to pass another bill, uh, AB 2894. Oh, crap, I'm forgetting the name of the bill. But anyway, it was proposed by a uh, gay identified as man, Evan Lowe, and it would criminalize or it would uh, outlaw conversion therapy under the um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not malpractice, but um, I'm blanking on the term that they would use for it. Um, when you sell something that's a scam and I'm blanking out. But anyway, uh, the idea would be that it's like this. What's that? It's a basic concept. He was trying to say, uh, fraud. Yeah, it's like being like a fraudulent practice, and it, it was so far-reaching this bill that if you went to a conference, if you went and bought a book on leaving homosexuality, it would be covered under the bill. So you wouldn't even be able to bring books in. There's a lot of people who are talking like this bill could essentially outlaw the Bible because. The scripture itself talks about freedom from homosexuality. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 13. Such were some of you. That gives a lot of people hope when it condemns homosexuality, but then it says, but such were some of you, but you've been, you've been changed, you've been delivered, you've been washed clean. And so when there's like, and this wasn't just going to be for conversion therapy for minors, this was going to be for everyone. And it would have impacted churches if you as long as you charged, but even if you say if you took an offering, then it would be liable to uh, the, uh, the ban. And so that got people riled up. So a lot of my friends in this field, they, they all went to the legislature and they gave their testimony. And they compiled a lot of their testimonies into a book. This was start of the change movement. You got testimony after testimony here. I can, oh, let me see how I got it. Andrew Kamiski. He's the one who runs Dead Street Ministries, one of that, that leads the ministry that we're going to be starting up. So it is one of his voices in here. Uh, let me see. Linda Seiler. There's my friend. She's the one who came up with the uh, Five Streams model. So she's one of my colleagues in uh, Three Story Ministries. Uh, we equip the Assemblies of God to address LGBT issues. Uh, Kathy Grace Duncan, former trans woman. Or she used to be a man. You know, you know, was, she had gone through the whole transition and everything. Now she's redeemed. So many testimonies. People are rising up, and this gives hope to others. One of the books I, that I picked up at the conference, Piercing the Nights, uh, Lindsay Kaiser, she shared uh, one of the nights, and it's all about how to intercede for the LGBTQ. And this is just a book of prayers, specific prayers for how to intercede for those who are lost. It's powerful, the insight she gave there. When we get into the trans stuff, Desis, D-Trans, and Detox by Maria Kuffler. It's a great resource. I, I would say you can even use it just for LGBT, LGBTQ in general. Um, I've seen her speak a couple times. I've met her a couple times in person. And, um, yeah, she's, she's good. She's got a lot, a lot of good stuff in here. The idea is that what we're seeing is... The whole LGBTQ movement, especially the trans aspect, is like a cult now. So it, you have to use the same strategies that people use when they try to deprogram someone who's coming out of a cult. You've got to rescue them. You've got to save your kids out of this. Um, Joseph Nicolosi, A Parent's Guide to Preventing Homosexuality. So take that developmental law I mentioned, and if you want to get a little deeper with it, this is a good one. So those are just some resources. I've got I got bookshelves at home full of stuff. I got videos. I got catalogs of videos on my YouTube channel. Not just my own videos, but others out there. So I just try to make it a library, a compendium, an archive for others. So I know we went a little long here, but I'm down with taking some questions. If anyone else wants to pick my brain a bit, uh, let me also the plug. In two weeks we're gonna I have a documentary called Disconnected. 
uh, that we, I think we showed a trailer. Did we show a trailer to it? We had not done that. Oh, okay. So we'll make sure we do that. It'll happen, it'll happen this next week. Cool. And so I was at the screen with that, and uh, Maria Keffler uh, is in that. She's one of the people featured in it. And so I got to go to a screen with the director, Maria Keffler, and one of the other people featured in it, Aaron Brewer, who was a former uh, trans, she's a detransitioner. And so we're going to be doing that documentary screening. It's best for us to really tackle the trans issue, because that really deserves even more uh, conversation. Uh, one of my friends is Brandon Showalter. He's a reporter with the Christian Post. And he covers the trans issue. He's been in a couple documentaries himself, so he actually shared another documentary with us at the conference. And so people like him, uh, some others that I, I've seen at other conferences, I've gotten so much information from them on what goes on in this transing of our children. It's, it is insane and barbar barbaric. So I definitely want to share that documentary so you guys can be better equipped for that issue in particular. All right. Could you give your um, YouTube channel? Your yeah, channel yeah if you just want to find me on YouTube, just search for Psycho Bible, one word. Valley about psychology and theology. So, um, I just wrote an article uh, for the Christian Post, an op-ed, and uh, I'm going to do a follow-up on that because that kind of triggered all the right people. <laughs> Because I wrote a, an article like my appeal to LGBTQ affirming Christians, and like what you do when you are affirming LGBTQ, you're actually aligning with all the trauma that they've experienced that helped lead them to where they're at. You're not actually loving them, and so I got people triggered with that one. So I'm, I am working on my video that's a response to all the pushback I got with that one. Yeah. Dealing with what you just said, one of your first points. Of dealing with somebody from the community of LGBT was to not say anything negative concerning the gay. Yeah, yeah, I can't stand people saying, oh, that's that, so gay. That, that sentence doesn't make sense to me with what you just said about all you that confirm. <laughs> if you're not speaking negative, then you're confirming. Mm. And I realize I've got the black and white in my mind there, but I, I, I struggle with how to make a distinction between the two. When it's used as a uh, derogatory term, um, just like using fag, queer, as like an insult. Um, mind you, I used to do a lot of speaking to youth, so that's actually part of what I would tell the teens, because it's very popular among teens, or at least it used to be. It's not really politically correct anymore. But if something was weird or kind of gross or lame, you would say, that's gay. And even though I'm not gay affirmative, to say that, and someone who's struggling with their sexuality, maybe they don't even identify as gay, but they have the same sex attractions, they still hear that as an attack on them. And it gives them the message, this is not safe for me here. Mm -hmm. I think about, um, there was a time I was at a men's retreat men's rally at my old church with, with our old fellowship and the the leader of our entire fellowship gets on stage and he starts going on a rant he's like god hates feminism and god hates abortion and god's hate god hates homosexuality and if you are one you better get delivered because god hates what it's doing to you and all i'm like ah oh, i'm cringing because i'm thinking if i was one of the guys in my group that i'm running all i would hear is that god hates me or at least hear that this is not safe for me to reveal this is a sin that I struggle with or a weakness I struggle with. Nope, this is not a safe place for me. So there are ways of speaking about it. Like I don't even use the terms gay, straight, uh, but rather same-sex attraction. Or gay identify if someone is identifying as gay or they have that gay label on themselves. I try, not to, I try to just be very plain about it. This is something I've personally had to work on. I'm the dude who would make gay jokes. When I first started working in this field, I'm like, God, you're calling me into this? I can't stand working with these guys. My wife, when we're in college, when we're still just dating, she's in the music department, and she had all these friends who clearly were dealing with same-sex attraction. And it was those people that God told me to start ministering to. 
and some of them were super flamboyant and very effeminate, and it would get under my skin. And God had to work on my heart to love them. And I had to work on not making gay jokes, not acting like, you know, mimicking them, but to see them for who they really are. To see the brokenness, to see the real man that's in there. And that's a powerful moment in my sessions when I work with a guy and, I, and we come to a realization, I, have, I affirm him as a man. I tell him, no man is more man than you. And that's one of those powerful things I can hear. I think about one of my clients. He was telling me a story about, uh, you know, like near the end of our session, he was sharing a story about this guy who called him some sort of derogatory term about gays. And I'm like, oh, it was something not derogatory about gays, but more like, you're a girl. You're, he's a French, he's a guy I see, he's in France. So it's like, whatever term in French, that would be like, oh, you're a girl, you're a sissy or something. And I'm like, what, that's bullcrap, you're a man. The next time I saw him the next week, he told me he cried so hard after our session, because that was the first time anyone ever affirmed him as a man. And he's in his mid to late 20s. First time anyone affirmed him as a man. And I was just saying it like, yeah, of course you are. And it's just, that meant so much to him. So yeah, I had to learn to have a sense of heart for these guys. And uh, bond with them. And the more I worked with them, the more I was like, when I ran that group at Valley Forge for years, it was more and more where I was like, there's so many things I have in common with you guys. It just didn't lead to same-sex attraction for me. Yeah, I had to tell the heart. Yeah, you had a question. On the other screen, the love, truth, and hope, <coughs> the second screen, right. On the bottom one, uh, help a friend dealing with this issue. Oh no, that's not it. But anyway, it was dig, don't, you know, it was almost like go ahead and dig down into the pain and, and hurt and wounds. Now, what, you, you just had some concerns as a professional about us non-professionals saying, well... I wasn't always a therapist. Or, or, I started off as a friend. I started off as just a regular guy. Okay. Accountability partner to guys who are struggling with these issues. Wow. And most of them have a hard time finding other guys that they can talk to and that they can be open with. You don't have to be a professional therapist to work. In fact, sometimes it's better for not. Because when I'm working with a guy and I'm affirming them, and then I ask them, how does it feel to hear me say that? There'll be a part of them that says, yeah, but you're just saying that because you're my therapist, so I'm paying you to say that. Even though I'm like, I've been doing this longer as a volunteer than as a paid therapist. <laughs> I did this stuff for years on a voluntary basis. But there's a degree to which not I'm getting paid, they're paying me to work with them. It discounts it to a degree. It means so much more for them when a regular guy, just a friend, is willing to work with them, come alongside them, hear their story, be curious about, what? Tell me more about this. Where did it start for you? What, how can I help you? How can I better understand this? And you're not grossed out by them, and you're not turned off, you're not worried about them being attracted to you, but you're like, can we give you a hug, man? Some of them are so affection deprived. They need to know that they're not a different category of man. They need that in community. That's the biggest thing they need is community. You're um, wanting to start up at the end of August the cleansing, not cleansing street, by all current, uh, cross current. <laughs> cross current. Um, and that's one of the biggest emphasis that can happen inside that issue that he's wanting to do during those, those times together. And I use the term stirring the darkness. Um, you're, you asked about, or, or should we? Um, be getting them to go to a place that's difficult for them. Um, you, you, you need to know what to do with that, so get trained with it. Um, but you need to let them stir the darkness so Holy Spirit can cleanse it and reach it out and yeah. pull it out and take the lies out. Um, and if you don't ever go there, uh, they're not going to get totally set free. And his uh, transformation um, concept that he had up on the screen requires that to happen to be really transformed. Yeah. And so that, that um, stirring the darkness, at, at, that's the term I use, uh, is very important. Yeah, and 
to work really in depth with the stuff, yeah, it does require some training. But sometimes, just having someone at your side to hear is so vital. My next video coming out, I just have to finish editing it, but I make this point um, about the two blind men who are begging for Jesus. And one of the things you can observe there is if you're suffering, you're struggling, don't do it by yourself. Have a buddy. Even if the only thing the other person can do is cry to Jesus with you. It still makes a big difference because Jesus is your ultimate answer. He's going to come in somehow. So, I just want to empower people and, and just know that God has a call on you. If there is someone in your life who is struggling in this area in any way, uh, you don't have to be a professional therapist to still be used by God in a powerful way. There's a, a, two questions, actually. One is, do you find in your counseling or whatever that most of the people that have same-sex attraction issues are because they've been molested sometime in their past, or is that not necessarily true? That person? It is uh, kind of... <clears throat> Just a minute. Uh, I'll hear the question. Okay, yeah, 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 good point. So the question is, uh, how frequent is it for guys with same-sex attraction to have a history of being molested in their past? There, there's a lot of data that well, about half of guys with same-sex attraction have some sort of early sexual experience. It's not always considered abuse because of the way they're groomed. In the gay community, uh, they'll refer to it as being initiated into homosexuality. Like that's, I had sex with an older guy. They don't, they don't think it's molestation. Until really they start doing the recovery, they realize that that, that was molestation. Uh, so the number is probably higher, but that's very frequent. But it's, I want to also combat the myth that that's all the cases. I've worked with plenty of guys who never were molested, and they developed same-sex attraction. Uh, but it, I would say, at least with the clients I've worked with, at, at least a third. It's, and the, the molestation might not always be from an adult, but maybe like an older teen. So that's another thing that makes it hard for them to recognize as a molestation, because it's someone who's like just a little bit older than them. Maybe it's an older cousin. Maybe it's a, a friend. Maybe they're the same age, but that friend was sexualized somehow and experiment on them. And it had a certain impact on them. So I worked with some guys where they were the one who initiated. So, uh, I've seen a variety, that's for sure. Because the other question I have is, has to do with the trans community and the use of the pronoun. How do you work with the use of pronouns or acknowledging? Because I feel like there's a situation in my, there's people in my you know, sphere of relationship that are, they're, they're not close, but they're, they're you know, within a one degree uh, mm -hmm. where they're transing, and mm -hmm. I have a hard time with the fact that it's like you're lying to them, you know, and how do you honor, quote unquote, that individual, but also say this is, you know, that's not who you are. You, who you are mm -hmm. is who God created you to be. Yeah. And how do you walk this road of, like, not lying, because if you're telling, if it's a girl and you're saying it's a boy, it's not, that's not true. The truth is God made her a girl, mm -hmm. you know, or vice versa. And t so what, what is your, you know, how do you? Yeah, so the question is how to navigate pronouns. If someone is not identifying as their true sex, I also don't like to say biological sex, because that makes, it's a, there can be biological sex and some other sex. No, no, there's just, just sex. That's what you are. Um, but the world keeps dividing things and getting us more and more confused. So, um, how do we navigate that when someone has some other self-concept or label for themselves and therefore they come up with other preferred pronouns they want other people to use when they're talking about them? This is another thing that's interesting. Pronouns aren't used when you're talking to someone, but when you're talking about them. So it's really compelled speech, really requiring you to, to think about them and talk about them in a certain way. 
um, even in, when you're not present. So it's a lot of control. It's really a way to engineer society to affirm this, this lie. So yeah, you are lying when you're using pronouns. When you know, like if I never knew the person, if they were already sort of transitioned, I couldn't tell. Some people might pass. And I didn't know, I'm, like, I'm, not gonna, I'm not sitting because I didn't realize they passed. But once I find out, then I correct that. Now, that's a case-by-case -case situation, how you deal with it with that person. How you deal with it with that person, you want to use some sensitivity toward it depending on the relationship. If I don't have that close a bond with them, but I want to actually have some sort of connection so I can keep ministering, I'm probably just going to avoid using pronouns in general. So if I talk about them and they're in earshot and they can hear me talking about them, I'll just use their name when I say their name or when I refer to them. But do you use the name that they... Well, names are different. So you can, you can legally change a name. But pronouns are an indicator of how you are as a, as a male or female. So if they legally change their name, that's different. If they just prefer to go by a certain name, I want to have more of a conversation with that person. Depends on the relationship I have with them. Now that said, the detransitioner stories I, I know of, one of the main things that helped bring them back to their lifeline was parents who loved them but never affirmed their other identity, their self-concept, their trans identity, their their non-binary, their asexual, trans, whatever, gender fluid identity. They never went along with the pronouns or the name. Sometimes the name is as important as the pronouns. But the main thing is that they had parents who loved them, they were committed to them, they did good by them, they tried to stay connected with them, but they didn't go along with the narrative. They didn't keep calling them that other name. Once you start going with that other name, it's hard to back out of that. And when that person eventually desists or detransitions, they don't want to go back to the people who affirm their trans identity. Because they're like, you all lied to me. You went along with this false narrative. I can't trust you anymore. Who are they going to go to? The parent that they hated because they didn't go along with them, but they are still loving to them. So as long as you can preserve that relationship so it's still loving, it's still kind and gentle, if you preserve that while still holding that line to truth, you're being the lifeline to that child. When they're ready to repent, they'll know they can trust you because you didn't lie to them. You cared about them enough to, to offend them. But you didn't do it to offend them. That's the important thing. That's every case I know of. It was one of the lifelines was a parent who still stuck it with them as much as they could. A lot of times the, student, the, the child will reject them, but that's their choice. But if you're just an acquaintance, then it's... I wouldn't go along with the pronouns in general. I just would probably be careful if I say them when they're in earshot. So, and... It, look, the reality is, because a lot of this is going to come up in work, right? Your HR policies, and like, I'm going to get fired if I don't use this person's pronouns or whatever. Maybe we need that. Maybe enough people need to start saying, enough of this, this lie. The emperor has no clothes. We need to start speaking up. I'm not going to purposely offend people, but you're violating my conscience by requiring me to lie about this. And that's what's got us where we're at. Enough people are too scared to speak the truth. So, in a relationship with someone, have sensitivity, try to uh, have tact. But at some point, the herb's going to be the road, and you've got to decide for yourself, am I more worried about this job? Am I putting my faith in this earthly system or in God? I'm going to go with God because that's what got me through everything. I was kicked out of grad school for the work I do. And I'm, I've already been canceled. <laughs> All right? Why don't you be canceled once to breathe? <laughs> I'm going to keep fighting because... Like I mentioned, Canada has this really bad bill. At the conference, I was talking to this other, other minister. He's in Canada. 
And he's like, he has not let Canada's Bill C-4 stop him from speaking the truth. He still does his speaking engagements, and he still shares his testament about leaving homosexuality. And right now he's being faced with a lawsuit. All these gay activists are coming after him now to try to sue him. And he's like, it's not going to stop me. I'm going to keep going. Maybe we need a little persecution, he said. such a short amount of time. Yeah, but yes. I mean, that, that, and, and it's doctors and nurses that are asking this. People that know science, you know, science is supposed to, you know. Yeah. Well, as we'll see in the documentary, the medical field has been bought in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. When I was in high school, the word queer um, was used, very derogatory, of course, but yeah. um, used to encompass Lesbian and gay and homose and gay homosexual men. Yeah. Um, and you were queer, um, whether male or female, and you had the same sex attraction. I do not comprehend queer as it's used in today's culture. So the change of the usage of the word queer, it goes back to the Marxist agenda right now to deconstruct everything. So they have uh, reappropriated the term for themselves. Sort of like how you see black people, they're allowed to use the N-word, but no one else can. So the, and I can't say it's just for homosexuals. It's queer now refers to anyone who is outside of the uh, normative sexuality, what they would call to heteronormative or cis-heteronormative. What's that? So, cis is another made up word or pre prefix to refer to identifying based on your actual sex. Right, I understand that, but it's a head So, of so uh, queer would be anyone who is in the LGBTQ plus 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 spectrum. So, this is just a term in general for anything that is not someone who is comfortable in their body as a male or female or someone who uh, has some degree of attraction to the same sex or. Uh, any little, what they're doing now with identity is any little idiosyncrasy in your uh, sexual proclivities or thinking or your feelings becomes justification for a whole new sexual identity. And so they say all of that is queer. Now, this is part of a larger agenda to deconstruct our norms. So they actually use queer as a verb as well. We are queering society. We are queering our norms. 
to make, because queer means to make something weird, to make it different. That's what their, their agenda is, to make what is understood as the norms, to make the norms no more. They don't want any more sexual norms. That's the ultimate goal. This is, ultimately, this is the Antichrist agenda. God has a, a created order that Satan hates. So, you've got to rev cause a revolution. So you have to undo the norms that are already there. So you can now have a new norm. This is why LGBTQ is basically the new state religion. And if you don't go along with it, you're in trouble. So, yeah. Therefore, I speak out in public at different points in time. If I drop the Q out of LGBT and only use LGBT, is that being derogatory? Uh, oh, no, I, mean, I mean, the queer is for all that in there, uh, but you've already stated, so why repeat it? Yeah, I mean, it's, at this point, uh, if you just say LGBT, that's, a, that's sufficient. Most people know what you're talking about. You don't have to add the Q. You don't have to add the plus sign. If you want to be real technical, it's LGBTQ, Q, I, A, 2, S, P. It just keeps going on and on. A, A. It's a I can spat them all off to you, but it's, it's, sort of like, it's endless. Sort of like pi, 3.14, right? <laughs> uh, it's, like I said, every little idiosyncrasy of your sexual proclivities. The thing is, all right, so general, for, for years, only about... 3% at most of the population was LGB or had some sex attraction. That's what 10%. All right. Now, we were always told that it was 10%. How many of you remember hearing the, the yeah. lie that 10% of the population is gay? 10%, yeah. Well, at least the activists would always promote that. Now, that was based off Alfred Kinsey's really shoddy and reprehensible research, which was all done with prison inmates and sex offenders and his own barbaric. Research. He would do disgusting things to children and babies and infants. All right, to try to prove that people are sexual at birth. So, so he's like, well, ten percent of the time they're responding homosexually, they're acting homosexual. So ten percent of the population is gay. All right, and the gay rights activists use that. Why? That's part of their justification for getting homosexuality removed from the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual that the APA uses for mental disorders. Because one of the criteria for a mental disorder is statistical infrequency. If something is not very common, then it could be uh, used as justification for it being disorder. But 10%, that's pretty common. That, it can't be abnormal if it's that frequent. So they really want to push that lie. But what they've been doing with all the propaganda is they're actually fulfilling that lie and then some. So what is the population? Do, so, do they have access? In general, now it is about 10% because yeah, yeah. of Gen Z. Okay. Millennials, more like 5%, there are stats that show Gen Z is identifying somewhere on the LGBTQ spectrum up to 40% because of how fierce the propaganda has been. I mean, forget about Gen Alpha, you know, the, your, our current kids, it's gonna be 50, 60% for them. This is the spirit of death. This is the culture of death. Because, especially if they go down the trans route, they're gonna